Welcome everybody to uh, the Cloud Foundry Summit session Hitchhiker's Guide to the Enterprise Great Platform. Um, I'm from SAP, but don't panic, everything's okay. So um, I was just told by a colleague I forgot the most important thing. It's actually a towel. So in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the towel is the most important asset you can use. But that's not what we want to talk about today. So uh, I'm Guna Guerra, I'm working in the Product management uh, of a task offering from SAP, the HANA Cloud Platform. And um, what I want to talk about today is actually share with you um, SAP's journey in, in the enterprise grade platform um, and how Cloud Foundry also plays a role here, what kind of challenges um, we have faced with regards to, uh, to speed, um, that's our customers' demand multi-cloud that we already heard quite often already even um, now that the Cloud Foundry um, Summit started just right now before this uh, session another one about multi-cloud deployments uh, very important for us security topics that uh, we also with, with Cloud Foundry and the very prominent other topics part um, so where I will talk about other topics so um, before going now into the challenges that SAP um, faced, let me just explain briefly where SAP is coming from, so that you also understand what, um, what our strategy is. So um, SAP is focusing on, on business uh, applications uh, for quite some time, so since 1971, so as old as I am. We have, uh, yes, I know, I look older. Uh, we have around 20,000 developers in research and development um, at SAP, and um, our goal right now is really help customers with um, their digitization that we always hear around uh, IoT or in Germany, Industrie 4.0, which is something totally different than IoT. I'm just kidding. Um, and if you hear SAP, normally you don't connect it directly with, with, uh, with cloud offerings, right? But um, we're not really new in the business, so I put here some, uh, some dates um, about um, products we have in place for different purposes. So we started with uh, Success Factors, uh, a company we acquired uh, around um, human capital management, uh, Ariba for business networks. Um, 2012, we came up with our own platform as a service offering uh, for uh, tackling the requirements from, from our customers, so our own path with the HANA Cloud platform. And then, yeah, it goes along. Hybris, Conquer, uh, now in S uh, SAP S4HANA. So another business suite completely in the cloud. And um, I mean, while you are seeing this, and also maybe with the history, who of you knows SAP at all? Maybe just raise your hand. OK. I always make a, uh, um, a test question. Who of you didn't know SAP before? Could you also raise your hands? OK. Who of you didn't pay attention to my question? <laughs> OK, good. So. And I mean, coming from, from a company that is also known for mostly on-premise applications, so we, we had a long way, so, um, and also had to evolve with regard to how we were set up and how we worked, right? So I put here some, some um, uh, just some buzzwords, but it really means a substantial change also in how SAP developed software, right? So we came from a water model, a waterfall model to agile development and uh, are going over to DevOps, right? Um, and in our applications, we are moving away from creating this big SAP monolith with a lot of power and uh, cycles of uh, one year or release cycles of one year or half a year over to uh, microservices and uh, also deployments of our products on, on biweekly basis. Yeah, and we are and we are keep on changing. Uh, from physical servers uh, via virtual servers over to to containers, um, and then also now container frameworks, and the the, the journey keeps on going, right? Um, from a data center to hosted environments to uh, um, to cloud environments that we have to to set up, really to also tackle uh, the requirements again from our customers that they have to to run their businesses, um, and uh, a lot of work also moving from uh, proprietary tools that SAP. Um, develops op um, over to usage and contributions to open source and, and standards. So quite a, a, long, a long way. So and what do we need to ensure uh, during that journey? So our customers of course still want to 
run their business on, on top of what we are doing. Um, but they want to have, of course, everything should be still fast, secure, so exclamation mark, secure, scalable, non-disruptive, so you don't want to use uh, new stuff, right, and suddenly your business that uh, keeps your business running um, stops working because SAP has done an, an upgrade. Uh, you don't want to have that. We need to support 24 by 7 um, every day and also ensure, and ensure uh, depending on the requirements also from different industries, traceability of everything that is done, auditability, so whenever changes are done in the, in the back end, um, changes are done in, in, the, in the database, you need to know who has done it, who has access to these systems. Certification is also a big topic, so you need to have certain certifications for certain industries. Um, and while doing that, what do we do? So we, we try to focus really on those parts of our technology which we feel is differentiating compared to what others are doing and really engage in, in standards and open source um, to uh, leverage what is out there and also to contribute back what we think the, is also useful to the community. And we have a lot of learnings from, from that, right? So while doing this, there's a lot of stuff. So um, there you have uh, multiple options. So either you let others have the same experience. I put a quote here from the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, to the Galaxy. I've just had an unhappy love affair, so why do I don't see why anybody else should have a good time. Um, or you try to be a good um, uh, open source citizen and contribute back your learnings and, and, and share it with others so that they can, can leverage that. So, but we don't do it that standalone, right? Just contributing for, for contributing. It's, it's rather uh, a strategy around co-innovation, uh, open source and standards. So we try to learn from customers uh, what they need. So tomorrow there will be also a keynote from, uh, from uh, Mark Giel, uh, res res responsible for partnering at SAP. And you will learn there also um, what we are doing, for example, with Siemens. For, so who of you did uh, watch today the keynote from um, Sam Ramji? Okay, now again, the test question, who of you didn't? Okay, <laughs> okay, so good one. So um, uh, at the end of the summit, um, Sam put Siemens on one slide, right? So uh, with, with their IoT platform, Mindsphere. So that platform, for example, was built together with SAP, with the HANA Cloud platform underneath, and we are using that, uh, that co-innovation with the customer to really know what are the requirements from, from big customers in the IoT space, and to learn from, from them what they need, and then to incorporate this into our, our products, also maybe using partners to join the efforts, and then actually contribute technology that, is, that we feel is, is, is useful to the uh, um, open source community, back to the open source community so that people can leverage, they can even, even bring more requirements into that, and then concentrate on what is actually differentiating us from, from others. And just to put here some, some numbers, um, of, of contribution or n total number of contributors. That's this uh, bluish line here. Is it blue? I have color difficulties. It is blue, right? So, um, some, oh. so something around uh, 30, 30 contributors we have right now. So we learned today how much uh, contributors do we have uh, at, at the uh, Cloud Foundry community. Anybody, anyone paid attention to the number from, from Sam? Who knows, remembers? 130, right? So although you say, well, we have 20,000 developers in research and development, and only 30 are contributing to Cloud Foundry. But again, I mean, we are trying to use the, the platform and to fill it with the requirements from our customers and partners and building up on that, right? And uh, we didn't reinvent another platform as a service offering, right? We are taking now Cloud Foundry, which is already a very rich feature set, and try to leverage there and contribute back what we feel is, is also useful for the community. Okay, so now trying to go back to, to Cloud Foundry. So uh, what are our learnings, for example, with uh, regard to, um, to speed? So when setting up a Cloud Foundry um, instance, um, you are wondering, okay, how to set this up in a fast way? And for that, we actually um, 
worked on something we called Service Fabrik. So it's written with a K, it's no typo, it's a German Fabrik. Um, yeah. um, it's not English, it's, it's German and English. <laughs> <laughs> it's both, not in parallel, right? Um, so what are the challenges that we, what we faced when um, now setting up a Cloud Foundry instance? Um, um, normally you don't have any default services up and running um, off the shelf in Cloud Foundry. So uh, every provider needs really to take care of that, to set this up in a, in a, fa in a fast way so that you can provide the services either to your fellow uh, st uh, colleagues at, at your co uh, company or to your customers and partners. And also, um, the, the Service Broker API doesn't really, really help you a lot with uh, um, provisioning technology. It's very open, right? But with very open, it means it's very flexible. And with very flexible, you can do whatever you want. But yeah, it's, it's difficult to, do, to find out what you want, right? If there is nothing that you can take uh, to, to copy and paste. Um, the, uh, uh, it's also necessary to have backup and restore capabilities built in, which are not available yet, so it's something that we struggled with that we need to also provide to, to our customers because they have very high requirements in that, in that area. And uh, also the cloud controller, um, the, the, the cloud controller model is, is really very minimalistic and doesn't provide you any means for version control. So our requirements for a proper solution um, were to easily set up backing services so that uh, ideally you just click on a button or run a command. Um, it should be inexpensive for development and, and testing. Um, of course, reliable, isolated, and uh, in a high availability cluster, um, usable for productive usage, uh, quite important for us, so that it, it's not just a test environment which actually works, but is, is really something you can also deliver to, to customers. Um, yeah, focus on a few provisioning technologies. Um, to, to ease the development and operations of, of, that compo of these components, provide backup and restore, and uh, also to provide the possibility of having multiple um, versions of your services available, and then you simply select, I want to have this version or that version in my, uh, in my, my offering, and that's it, right? And for that, yeah, we um, worked at SAP with the Service Fabrik, with K, remember, it's German, um, to provide now a generic service broker uh, and, and, and a Bosch release. It supports um, provisioning on, on Docker and Swarm. And there is uh, also a possibility to use existing Docker Bosch releases with the Service Fabrik. Um, there is also a very generic dashboard available that you can use to find out, okay, what, are the, what, are, what is the URL of my service, what is the user and password, so something very basic that you don't have to do on your own, which you simply can reuse. There is also uh, the possibility to have an automated uh, stem cell and release update, so whenever you, have, uh, you find out there are, for example, some security issues, some security breaches, that you can fastly um, uh, exchange them in an automated way. Also providing you with the possibility to backup and restore, and we provide that uh, with the service fabric right now for OpenStack and a, uh, on AWS, it's on its way. So, and we are also open to um, other layers underneath. And there is also an operations tool available. And for those of you who want to try out, so it's available on GitHub since a few days, um, github.com slash SAP service fabric broker. And, uh, I'm just checking the time. Okay, are you still awake? Who's awake? <laughs> okay, who's sleeping? Okay, good. I will try to hurry up. Um, so I put here a, a little picture to a very uh, nice picture, which of course you understand immediately. Um, but just to explain a little bit, so the, the service uh, fabric um, broker is uh, providing you here an extension to the, to the cloud controller and um, also the possibility to actually add a plugin to your command line interface so that you can also use the service fabric di direct directly via the um, command line interface API. So extending actually uh, the API. Um, and then underneath uh, you see here the different provisioning models that you can use then for uh, 
either uh, Docker instances um, or putting here the, the services on Bosch. So while we were talking um, briefly about, about the infrastructure as a service layer, um, I, I find it quite interesting when I was discussing with the colleagues who are working on another project called uh, Cloud Foundry. Oh. Any of my colleagues here who knows? If not, come to the booth and I will try to get the right person. I'm not the expert in all of these technologies. I can't tell you. Okay. okay. So what I found interesting when, when looking into the, the infrastructures, um, that um, there is an, a nice, um, it's not a quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but it's actually from uh, the uh, OpenStack documentation on Cloud Foundry saying uh, the requirements, so, so to, to know whether or not your Cloud Foundry installation runs, um, for example, on OpenStack, the requirements listed here are considered necessary but not sufficient for Bosch to be able to use your OpenStack deployment. If you cannot perform any of these tasks successfully, Bosch will not work. However, satisfying all these requirements does not ensure that Bosch will work. So it's either, so you, um, you stick to what is necessary and then you think you are fine, but no, it's not, right? So meaning, uh, while validating the, the infrastructure, you might find out that um, it doesn't work. So the challenge is that um, SAP also wants to run um, one Cloud Foundry installation in, in various data centers, and um, the question is, will now this installation run on the customer's or, or partner's uh, OpenStack distribution, right? And if you um, using the, um, the tooling which is available right now, you have a very uh, hard time to uh, understand the, the errors messages you're getting back from, from Bosch, so you need to have um, a deep Bosch expertise. And what we wanted to have is actually the possibility to have no deep Bosch expertise for that. Um, it should be easy to use and to also have error messages with uh, actionable um, uh, descriptions, right? And for that, we have uh, also open source the Cloud Foundry OpenStack validator. And it actually will respond to the uh, question, will it run on my OpenStack installation? Um, there is uh, an executable and also a configuration file that you can set up for, for your uh, Cloud Foundry environment. And um, you will actually get also actionable uh, hints also for non-Bosch expert. Let me try if I can increase. Yes, I can. I love my Mac. <laughs> so, so this, these are the, f the, the error messages um, you get. For example, um, your OpenStack using the CPI can create large disk. Large disk could not be created. So it tells you if you are using DevStack, you need to manually set a larger backing file size in your local RC. So, and underneath also another another failure, right? So you're getting really actionable hints on um, what to do to avoid these um, error messages or to make the, the environment actually work on your site. So another, uh, I'm doing okay with the time. So another um, source of, um, of surprises, uh, also security. So uh, another quote from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Nothing travels faster than the speed of light with the possible exception of bad news, which obeys its own special laws. So um, SAP, as well, all the customers and partners who are running uh, their businesses, they are very, um, um, they, they don't like risks, right? So, and with the, with, uh, the, the Cloud Foundry uh, setup, you, you might get into the issues that uh, attackers might be um, uh, listening to, uh, to the network traffic between the nodes, right? And if they have the right tooling, right, they might get maybe uh, passwords, uh, usernames going between the nodes. So um, what we wanted to do is actually to encrypt all the traffic between um, the, the nodes so that even if the attackers are listening, that they just get gibberish uh, or Portuguese or whatever. So things they don't understand. Um, if there is uh, something which, which uh, um, 
although you took care of it, um, really drops or, or doesn't work anymore, or there is a security breach anyways between in this um, encryption, that you can dynamically reconfigure it so that um, without a downtime, you just set up another uh, algorithm and then the, se the security breach is, is, uh, is closed. And um, also, it should have no impact on scalability, meaning if you uh, want to um, run this in, 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 uh, in multiple instances so that uh, this encryption doesn't really um, hinder you on scaling broader, so it doesn't need uh, a lot of, of resources. So that's um, why SAP came up with um, the, the Bosch release for IPsec. So um, it actually is doing exactly that, so encrypting all the communication inside um, a Cloud Foundry deployment between the nodes and uh, can also be used then as, as a core deployment, right? And it actually works uh, in a way that it, it's using um, encryption on the, on the kernel. Yeah. Just to get that right, are you referring to IPsec as the um, um, network protocol, or is that another term that SAP captured? For no, no, it's, it's, a network, it's a network protocol uh, that is available as, as, a, as a Bosch release that you can take then and deploy then in your, in your Cloud Foundry installation. So it is using what you know from IPsec also in, in the Cloud Foundry setup. So it's, it's IP protocol, I don't know, 5.0 uh, as specified 20 years ago uh, by the IETF. Yes. That's what we are talking about. Yes, All exactly, right. exactly. And you're doing, the ch uh, so you're using what is already existing in the Linux kernel. Okay, now the legendary other topics. Um, things that we also uh, are working on and uh, uh, and identifying how to actually leverage that also for uh, the Cloud Foundry community. So we are uh, looking into lifecycle management of, um, of uh, applications. So we are currently trying to define a standard for creating these uh, packaged Cloud Foundry apps so that you can deploy them in different locations. I think uh, Sam also talked about that today in his, in his keynote. And you should be able to actually toke, take these applications and deploy them on any of those um, Cloud Foundry certified platforms. So that's, that's the idea. We are already using it uh, inside SAP for um, blue-green deployments to ensure that uh, there is always a productive system up and running. And we are currently finding out how to bring this now to the foundation and uh, actually do a, a co-development with the community. Uh, what we are also, uh, currently ramping up, uh, along with, with uh, big partners with IBM and Orange, um, collaborations around uh, uh, auto-scaling and auto-sleep of, of applications. So uh, put in here the, the, the GitHub uh, links to these, uh, to these projects. So again, uh, not trying to reinvent the wheel again, but instead getting bigger partners uh, into the boat, also getting their requirements into our, uh, into our uh, uh, standard and then really leveraging that and contributing back to the community so um, that others don't have to go into uh, to to discuss again or think again, how do we do an auto scale on Cloud Foundry, um, how we ensure auto sleep to, to ensure we don't spend too much money on putting uh, machines uh, uh, up and running um, on, on, on a landscape which really costs us money, right? So trying to put here a standard in place that others can use. And last but not least, also working um, in, in, in Diego and Abacus uh, around, around metering um, and uh, the uh, Diego framework, uh, putting here also a number of full-time committers that are working on this. Um, so also trying to push what is done now in the community uh, with and, and put in our requirements that we know from customers and partners, so this also finds its place into the standard. So that's it, what I wanted to go through with, with you. Who is still awake? Okay. So, uh, opening up to questions. Yes. How far would you think is backup and and restore sort of away on the timeline? Is it like a year, a half year, or kind of Backup and restore? Yeah, because yeah. you mentioned it initially, but you didn't have a project on it. 
Yeah. So I think, I mean, backup and restore is something we need to, I mean, for, for, for us it's a no-brainer. I mean, we, we have it today. Um, from from a, a Cloud Foundry perspective, uh, I'm not sure if we are providing anything there. I mean, we, we I discussed it briefly in the service fabric. Um, so it's available right now. So there are uh, basic requirements we um, we tackle with with the uh, service fabric to provide an easy way to do backup and restore. It's um, for for OpenStack. It's there for AWS. It's on its way. I can't really tell you now for AWS when it will be there. But I mean, to to uh, um, yeah yeah. I mean, what we are. To, I mean, uh, what I wanted to bring across here is actually we are already working on this at SAP, right? So for for most of the things I have shown you here, we already have. A solution built in into our products. So what we what we try to do is to put these efforts into the community back so that something can be reused, right? And for for, for the service topic, there is now already something for for OpenStack. Any other questions? This applies to applications, but not the service. Services, services. Yeah, so lifecycle management of applications, right? Yeah, so the idea is that you package your applications in a way um, where you say, okay, if you, if you use the standards for lifecycle management, you can take that application and deploy it on any other certified um, Cloud Foundry installation. Of course, it will then depend, right? So if you're, if you're writing an application which uh, uses proprietary technology, um, of course, you can't move it, right? Because the proprietary technology is is somewhere else. Um, I don't know how this will be tackled in this in this uh, in this standard. But the the goal is really, I mean, from a from a user perspective, to know, uh, okay, if you put the stamp here, uh, lifecycle management according to Cloud Foundry standard X Y Z, you can move it to another platform. Maybe there are will be some rules that uh, you should not use any proprietary technology underneath. Because then it's yeah it's it's not possible. It's mainly around everything around the lifecycle management to package things. Yes. Yeah, uh, are you using on a daily basis um, on Hana the IPsec release? Pooh, good question. And uh, come to the booth, and I will find the right person for you. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, so, so who of you knows Hana? Can you raise your hands? I'm a very active person. Okay, who of you does not know HANA? Yeah, don't be shy, yeah. So, so HANA is an in-memory database, and it's um, well, not only an in-memory database, it's, it's an appliance, so it's, it's, a, it's a big machine with certain capabilities uh, to run uh, in, a database in memory. Um, and I mean, just that, that setup is already a platform on its own. And um, this, this whole platform is also available uh, on our PaaS offering. So uh, whether or not IPsec is already used in HANA, it's something I can find out for you. Just, just come by the booth and I will get the right person or just call a colleague. Yeah, but as I said, I mean, from, uh, from the beginning, what we really need to cover is um, everything around requirements about security and, 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 and cloud. And as you know, um, also European companies are very um, conservative with regards to cloud. So that, uh, that's why also security here plays even a bigger role. Uh, so would this uh, replace the classic sub of installations um, at the customer's uh, side? Um, no. So it's, it's a platform as a service offering. Um, I, I don't want to bore you now with, with uh, product-specific stuff. So the HANA Cloud platform is really a pass offering. And what we are using it for is really to, as a possibility to extend other solutions. It could be an SAP R3 system, which is running somewhere on-premise. It could be um, a an, an, an database from another vendor where you want to expose certain data into the cloud, right? But it's, it's not substituting on-premise system. It's, it's rather a platform for us to, to integrate with other systems, to extend other systems, or yeah, to build new applications on top of it. It's not to substitute others, because SAP didn't have a, plat a platform as a service offering before. Further questions? Okay. With that said, thanks and don't panic. But there is one thing 
I forgot to tell you, because I told you you would actually learn uh, the formula for, answer the, for life, the universe, and everything. So, okay. So, it's easy. Just come um, <laughs> and join our SAP booth. It's booth number four. And you can find out two together with the SAP colleagues. So, the answer is again 42. And if you want to get in contact with me, here is my information. You can find me on, on, uh, uh, on Twitter, Rui Nogueira, or at rui.nogueira.sap.com. That's it. Thanks a lot for listening.